Dr. Singh is here on a three month uh, traineeship sponsored by the Indian, Indian government. And while he's here, he was very kind to, to prepare this presentation to tell us what's happening in India in terms of aquaculture and possible opportunities to boost aquaculture in India. Uh, thank you, Jose, for giving the brief introduction about me, and also thank you to James Cook University for hosting me here for three months. So it's a great privilege for me to present a brief scenario of the Indian aquaculture, what's going on, what are the opportunities, and what are the challenges ahead. Just before it, uh, just an update of the global aquaculture, because we are dealing with a very important sector that is the production sector, which is not only an option for livelihood, but also a source of food security for the billions of people. And we can see here that uh, the production of the aquaculture system uh, is increasing day after day. And we can see that uh, the dependence on the aquaculture is more likely to happen vigorously in the coming years because there has been a stagnancy and also the need for sustainable approaches in the fishing of the mad resources is becoming a very big concern globally. And uh, aquaculture, if you see uh, from the the uh, environmental aspects, the uh, climate change aspects. Uh, we can see that uh, this fish culture is one of the, uh, the sector which has the minimum uh, FCR, which is the food conversion ratio, and also a very, very low amount of emission of the different greenhouse gases. This uh, harness is potential to become a major food production sector in the sustainability uh, climate. So coming about the uh, Indian contribution to the global aquaculture, uh, we all know that India is also a, one of the major producer of fish in terms of volume uh, next to China. But if you can see the figure of this person, the data, we can see that there is a huge gap uh, between, the, between the China, which is the top producer, and India. And also, if you see the population-wise, now the population of India is almost in, at par with the Chinese uh, population. So we can see that uh, uh, the Indian aquaculture uh, sector, also, uh, although it is in the in the in the verse of becoming uh, larger and larger, it has to cope up several times, many folds, uh, to feed the population. And in India, you can see the data here that in the last 20 years, uh, the sector of this aquaculture has contributed to, uh, up to from the third one third to almost half in the last 20 years. And it is likely to contribute to around uh, by 62% in the year 2030. This is the assumption and prediction based on the on the uh, the current scenario. So this is a resource and a production snapshot of India. Uh, India is having a very good resources in terms of marine resources as well as the, the inland resources. In terms of the marine, we have a very long coastline of around more than 8,000 kilometers. And also we have the EEZ, that is the exclusive economic zone of more than 2.02 million square kilometers. Apart from this, we have the resources in terms of different kind of uh, reservoirs, different kind of lakes, different kind type of uh, ponds and tanks that is available in the Indian sector, which has a great potential for expansion. Uh, but there are several concerns because uh, you know that uh, this coastline is also used for other sectors. This is multi-sectoral. Uh, uh, use of this uh, coastline is again becoming a big uh, issue in Indian uh, also with regard to the policy matters and also with regard to the ecological concerns. So Indian uh, current production during 2020 is around 14.73 million metric tons, which contributes uh, around 68 from the aquaculture sector with an average growth rate of around 10.87 percent. And uh, this sector uh, contribution to the agriculture sector as a whole is around 7.28. And uh, in terms of the export value, India is exporting to the tune of around 7.74 billion uh, US dollar, and this is the fourth largest fish exporting country. Now, uh, coming to the, the food security, because uh, uh, India, uh, now we can see that uh, India has a very, very diverse population of these species, and in India, there are almost more than 3,000 species of uh, fish that is recorded from both the marine and the inland resources. And uh, with this diversity of these uh, fish resources, uh, mostly in the, in the three uh, global hotspots, that is the, the, the Western hotspot and the uh, Indo 
Myanmar host port and the Himalayan host port. So these three uh, host port, they have the wide diversity of the fishes. And also, if you see at the map, we can see that uh, a large population of India, excepting the, some of the northwestern uh, part of India, other parts of the country, it is more of uh, a fish eating population. And it is more vigorous and more intense the population of the southern part of India and eastern part of India. This is more, they are more preferring to have the fish as a, as a dietary component. And in India, the, almost 12.8% of the total animal sources, protein sources, is coming from the uh, fish proteins. However, if you see the, the graph here, we can see that uh, per capita consumption of fish is likely to come up and is increasing daily. And uh, there is a, a, a projection of 18% uh, change in the food, uh, uh, fish protein consumption by the year 2030. So uh, now India uh, has to tackle this problem of uh, uh, deficit of this uh, 5.0 per kilogram per person per year fee, uh, fish availability as compared to the global target of around 20.5 kilograms per person. So India has to now come up with uh, solutions and the policy to have uh, a very of uh, domestic market oriented uh, production rather than the export market because if you see the, the resource availability measure proportion of the resources that in the southern India it is now based on the export oriented market because if you, if you see the uh, in the letter side, I'll be coming up with the, the production of the stream farming that is more of the export oriented. So now India has to have the balance between the export and the domestic consumption to have the, uh, the, the surplus, surplus supply of the food uh, for the growing population. So this is the trend in the fish production and the seed production. Uh, in the, in the last uh, almost five years, the area has been increased of around four, 4 million metric tons of this fish production. And this is growing very fast within this last five years. Before that, India's production used to be stagnant within around uh, seven to eight million metric tons. But now, there is the, the change in the, in, the, in the technology and also change in the, in the uh, uh, awareness about the fish farming as a livelihood sector. The, the production is now increasing day after day, and uh, there is, has been lots of pressure on the production of the seed materials, which is still uh, insufficient in India to have the production target that is uh, estimated. So these are the key Indian states which plays an important role in the Indian fish production. Uh, on my right and left hand side is about the marine sector, another one is about inland sector. In the marine sector, we have many of the coastal states which are having uh, very good resources. Uh, among the, the um, among these states, uh, the states like Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, these are the major players in the marine sectors where they produce uh, almost 50% of the total production. Whereas in case of the inland sector, we can see that uh, India is uh, India is so much dependent on one state uh, that is the Andhra Pradesh, which is lying on the on the southeastern part of India. So this contributes to around around 36.1. Uh, 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 production of the total uh, in India and other states like this, uh, West Bengal and uh, other states like this, Tamil Nadu, then Orissa, they are also coming up as a major player in the Indian Indian production. So, talking about the key species and the systems, uh, uh, India is uh, probably a, a car farming country where the calf uh, it contributes to around 67% of the total uh, fish production in India. And apart from the calf in the freshwater sector, fungus and tilapia is an impo important fish species that is being farmed in very commercial scale. Uh, freshwater prawn, uh, I will be talking about this particular uh, species, which has uh, gained momentum in the recent year, although it was one of the priority species in the, in the earlier years. Apart from that, we have the diversified, diversified fish culture system where uh, diversification is taking place in many of the Indian states because of the needs for regional demands, consumer preferences, and also to adapt to the changing climatic conditions. So these adaptations, like uh, if you go towards the, the northern part of India where, the, uh, where the, the temperature is quite low, where the cold water fisheries uh, exist in the states of like uh, uh, Kashmir and uh, in the Sikkim, uh, this one popular species is the rainbow trout. I think you must be aware of this. This is the cold water species, which has now becoming a very important species on those areas uh, through the technologies uh, like this uh, RAs or the rescue systems. Because of the because of the scarcity of the water, uh, the promotion or the commercialization has not been up to a very 
uh, significant target, but still uh, they are coming up as a very important species. And also in the northeastern part of India, uh, this is uh, where I, I belong to. This particular species is known as the Osteobroma belangari. Uh, this is the, one of the very important fish species, uh, freshwater fish species, which is uh, known to have the, the omega-3 fatty acid. So from the nutritional point of view and also from the, the ethnic values, uh, this is also one important species. Likewise, in India, uh, as we know that uh, India is a very, very diverse culture and they have a, also diverse food habits and preferences for the different type of varieties of fishes in the place is very, very important. So uh, based on the regional and uh, the area diversification, we, we, we choose the particular species of that particular state and they go for the farming of the system. Regarding the systems, uh, we have the different system, but uh, in India, the corn based system is the most prevalent type of, of this farming system in the semi-intensive mode. But how, however, in many, of, many parts of India, uh, where the, the marginal farmers or the small farmers, they don't have much of the facilities. They go for the traditional farming system where they, they just go for a low, low number of stocking density and uh, they go for some the fertilization and some manuring to have the dependence more on the primary productivity rather than the supplementary feeding. So this is a two type of uh, system that is more prevalent. And other systems like uh, uh, people are doing more on of the uh, small scale ornamental fish culture of important indigenous uh, ornamental fishes. And also in the Kashmir, this is one photograph from the Kashmir where they are doing these, uh, the flow through systems or, or the, or the raceways. And also the, in the Indian sector, now case farming is becoming a very, very important venture in India because uh, case farming in the unutilized rivers and open water lakes is, is, it can be done with the very, very cheap materials like the bamboo frame and also with the different type of species uh, so that these water areas can be utilized very effectively. And uh, these, are some, uh, these are some of the integrated farming models uh, which we have in our, our country. Like integrated farming, uh, just to be aware of this house, uh, I want to tell the integrated farming is like one of the important aspects the government is now focusing because of the uh, is uh, more dependence on the organic farming systems because of the uh, uh, preferences for different kind of meat products in the different parts of the country. Uh, all tree is all acceptable in many parts of the country. Uh, apart from this, we have the piggeries, we have the cattle based farming systems. So like uh, whatever the waste material that is generated from this uh, uh, animal housings, this can be used as an input source uh, to be utilized as a fertilizer or manure for improving the primary productivity. And also this has the advantage of uh, resource utilization. It has, the, it has the advantage of crop security where a farmer, if he goes for a, a particular venture like uh, agriculture alone or animal farming alone or fish farming alone, there is always a chance of uh, uh, disease prevalence or any kind of natural calamities. So in the loss, in the in the in the process of losing one particular uh, venture, he may try to pick up the profit from the other other ventures. So this is like of interlinking of the different components, so that uh, the outcome is in a very very profitable and uh, and ecologically sustainable manner. And also like this, uh, as I wanted to show you, like this is very very popular in India, like where uh, where people are doing the plant, uh, cultivation of different kind of crops in the dikes. So that this dikes area can be can be used effectively for crop plantation, and also there is no need for any kind of irrigation separately for planting of these crops. So this is just one crop I'm showing. There are people doing the, the plantation of the the bigger bigger plants like banana plantation. They are horticulture horticulture based, or even the vegetable, or even the different kind of other plants. Uh, this is just just to show you that uh, now the globally uh, the last one. This is the bioflock system. The last one I'm showing here. The biofox system uh, globally is, uh, I should say, is, uh, is on a success uh, trend. But in India, biofox system is, again, uh, is yet to establish itself as a commercial level uh, uh, enterprise, fisheries enterprise. Because uh, the biofox system, it is uh, it's a very complex and, uh, and when it is installed in the rural area, there are always the problem of uh, uh, what we call the electricity uh, cut or cut off there in the rural areas. So there is a very big concern and also the technicalities regarding the, the, the maintenance, the, the water quality maintenance, the, the stocking density maintenance, and also the different type of feed that has to be uh, given to a particular type of species because all type of species, they, they have the different requirement for the different protein levels. And also they have the, 
different requirement uh, based on the, the in-situ flock that is formed. So this is a big concern in India and uh, many of the farmers, uh, many of the local youth, they, 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 they took up this particular venture during this uh, pandemic time. And uh, during those times, it was uh, profitable because the, 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 there was a shortfall in the supply of the, uh, what we call the fish and uh, the fish prices were very high. And uh, because of the, because uh, of, even though they, if they have the low production levels, they were able to sell it at a higher price. So profit was uh, very good their time. But now, as now the thing has normalized, again, those, uh, those uh, uh, systems are now no more profitable and many of them are uh, selling off their, their uh, systems. So there are lots to be done with this. And uh, I am also working on this biofloc system for last was last two or three years. I'm working on the different type of species and uh, different time of time for maintenance of uh, the biofloc system in India. Now coming to the most important part of the Indian farming, that is the carp farming. Uh, Indian carp farming is uh, mostly focused on the six species combination of the Indian major carp, that is the Katula, Rohu, and Regal, and the three Chinese carp, that is the grass carp, silver carp, and the common carp. So Indian uh, carp farming, uh, this is more or more of, uh, uh, what to say, uh, uh, concentrated uh, in one state uh, in, in Andhra Pradesh, which is the largest producer of these carps. Apart from that, other states, this is also a acceptable and the most farmed species in most part of the country. Regarding the, uh, the under Pradesh model, I just wanted to brief because there are different, like uh, in general, uh, carp farming is a semi-intensive farming system where they do the supplementary feeding along with the primary productivity of the pond systems. So for the, the stocking, they use different type of fish uh, sheet. Here, uh, they are using this fry, advanced fry and fingerlings, and another one is the yearlings. So in India, uh, this under this model, they use mostly the, the, uh, the yearlings, that is called stunted fingerlings. So stunted fingerlings is nothing but a fingerling production system where uh, they do the very, very uh, low level of feeding, but they stock the fish in a very, very high density. That is just to have the, uh, we have the, the concept of uh, 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 this one, compensatory growth. There is a concept of uh, compensatory growth where if you try to uh, just uh, give optimal, uh, just give the minimal level of feed to the fish, they will grow to a very, very low size. But when they are given the optimal level of feeding, they regain the, the loss in the uh, size. So they try to regain the loss in a very, very quick time. So this is the concept of standard fingerlings. So they do this type of seed rearing system for one year in under this. So after one year, when the, when the fish hardly becomes around, around uh, 100 to 150 grams, or even uh, less than that, they stop the fish in the in the ponds. So just to pick up the loss that they, they have over the one year, so they try to grow faster. And uh, in case of uh, species like Gatla, they grow to around two kilograms per year. And whereas in case of uh, Rohu, it grows up to around 1.5 kilograms. So they have a, bio, a, a better productivity, better biomass uh, conversion ratio. So that is the model they are doing. And regarding the feed in India, uh, for carp farming, people don't use much of these pellets. They, they, they use a mix of uh, pellets and also the mass feed. Mass feed is nothing but uh, it's a combination of two ingredients that is mostly the rice bran and uh, the groundnut polygate. So these uh, two are mixed together uh, in a very, very, what to say, uh, fine the mixture is met and uh, they prepare this. Uh, uh, sometimes they prepare the pellets also along with the, the uh, the mass. So this combination is given always in this uh, carp farming. That's why the pellet uh, uses is just around 1.3 percent, uh, whereas the mass and pellet is contributes around 30 percent. And others they give as a mass. That is, they make a dough and they give uh, to the fishes. This is uh, the carp seed production in India. Uh, this is showing you just uh, some pictures of how they are doing the carp seed production. Uh, we are more dependent on the Chinese carp hatchery, that is the eco, uh, eco, we also call it eco hatchery. And also people in the rural areas, they go, they go for the, the hapa based breeding, where they, 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 they have this net enclosures, which are known as the hapas in India and Indian subcontinent. So they use this kind of uh, hapas to breed the fishes. Uh, they use the most of these uh, synthetic hormones, uh, apart from that, they use the carp tree extract. 
So there are different types of brands available, like Oba Cream, Oba Tank, Oba Airfresh. And there are different types of synthetic hormones available, which are having the different effects on the different fish. So this is the uh, hatching pool. Uh, just I'm showing this picture, hatching pool. This is, uh, uh, there are two pools. One is the spawning pools, another one is hatching pools. So once the fishes are injected, they are released into the spawning pools. And once the eggs are released, they are at further incubated for another 18 to 20 hours in the incubation pools from where they are harvesting the, the, the spawns. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is the way how they are doing the carp feeding in, in Andhra Pradesh and many, many, many parts of India. So they, they go for this kind of back feeding. Back feeding is nothing uh, but where the, the mass after it is being mixed with water, it is being put in this kind of bags, perforated bags. So they make these perforations and they do hang uh, using either the pole system, there are the pole uh, that is uh, inserted in the, in the bottom and they just tie these poles in the, in the pond area or this is some kind of rope uh, system where they, they use the ropes to hang these bags and uh, during the, uh, during the when the fish, fish they come and eat all this uh, from feed from the bags. The, the advantage of this kind of feeding is that there is no any leaching of the, the because the, 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 the feed is already a, a powdered feed and or is a mass. So when you just throw it outside uh, uh, on the pond system, there may be some leaching or there may be deterioration of the water body over a, a huge period of long time. So in that case, uh, this uh, type of feeding system, uh, like this will be a more or less like an automated uh, demand feeder type. So whenever the fishes want, they can come and eat from these perforated bags. So these perforations, again, these are made, the size of these perforations are made based on the, the size of the particular fish at that particular instant. Because if the perforation is quite small, again, the, the feeding becomes a problem. So based on the, on the mouth size or the size of the feed during that particular instant, they prepare these kind of perforations. Another one is just so you go and uh, feed the feed the fish. If, if, if it's a very large water body, you have to go use a boat and just go for the pen feeding. This is the way they are doing in under bodies and other parts. Uh, just for information, in under bodies, uh, if you see the, the the size of the carp farm in farm ponds, these are quite big. Uh, a farm, it, like in Colorado region, a farm it, it may go up to around 20 to 30 hectares also. That must be farms are there, so it is quite difficult to have this kind of uh, uh, feeding system. So it takes a long time for feeding those uh, this one. So there they use the tractors that is ran along the dying area, and they just grow the feed over all over the uh, pond systems. Whereas in case of smaller ponds, like around two to three hectares, they go for such kind of systems. So these are three uh, models uh, of the systems. First one is the semi-extensive polyculture system. Another one is semi-intensive polyculture. So just the difference is based on the, the stocking numbers. Uh, in the semi-intensive polyculture, they have the higher stocking numbers of around 5,000 to 7,000 numbers per hectare. And with the bigger size species, like as I told you, the, the standard fingerlings of around 100 to 125 grams. Whereas in case of the extensive polyculture, they use the smaller size uh, fishes of around five to 10 grams. Whereas there is also a particular uh, system called the fattening. Fattening is nothing but uh, they are going to have the, the stocking of the zero point size. There is a particular term for zero point size, which is nothing but the underprivileged or undergrowth uh, fishes, which may happen due to the uh, food deprivation, or it may be due to uh, like uh, emergency harvest in the case of uh, disease attack. So those uh, seeds, those uh, fishes are being collected by the big farmers. They treat it and they go for stocking for a very, very short term that may be around three to four months. That's why they call it the fattening. So this, in this case, they have a very, very high productivity of around eight to 10 tons per hectare. So this is uh, one farming model they are doing with the big farmers in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, apart from the carp farming, uh, pangasius farming is also becoming very popular. Pangasius, you know, this is a very, uh, very good fish uh, in terms of productivity, but uh, there are concerns uh, where, where the fillet quality is a big concern and uh, they are not able to export to the other countries. So whatever pangasius production is there in India, it is mostly for domestic consumption. And uh, this fish, this, can, this has a very, very fast growth rate of around 1 to 1.5 kilogram in a year and productivity can be very high up to 
15 uh, tons per hectare because the stocking rate of this particular fish can be very high up to around 40,000 to 60,000 per hectare. And uh, uh, now, uh, since I think last five, six years, uh, there is a, a board or body in India called the National Fisheries Development Board. They are now promoting the, the culture of these fungus in the cages, in the reservoirs, where they are going to have the proper utilization of the, the, the ecosystems uh, where these fungus is, because this can also fit on the low protein diets and also the non animal protein diets. So, this has uh, been promoted by India in some of the states like uh, West Bengal and Andhra Pradesh. And uh, uh, this species uh, is uh, largely confined to Andhra Pradesh, but the seed production uh, is mostly confined to West Bengal. So West Bengal, what they do is West Bengal, they produce the seed and they supply the entire seed or the, a major proportion of the seed to Andhra Pradesh and they do farming in many, many pond system or now the case culture. And tilapia, tilapia is now like, uh, tilapia is a very controversial species. Uh, way back in 1952, Indian government, they, uh, they introduced this species uh, to have a very what is ecological uh, utilization of the different niches of the reservoirs in India. But again, due because as you know, this particular fish has a very uh, bad behavior of prolific breeding, breeding where it breeds in a very, very early stages and it propagates in a very uh, huge quantities over a very short time. So because of that, it was banned back in 1959. And now the, the culture of this particular species, that is mostly the Oricromis nonilopicus, that is the Nandulapia, is promoted for culture in many kinds of cases, ponds, uh, as a polyculture component or as a monoculture component. Uh, there has been a lot of work, I think, uh, on this gift project uh, and our is that uh, the gift tilapia, which has a very, very, what is a good growth rate of around 17% extra growth rate from the original ones. So they can be done uh, for, for many of the farming systems for producing a, 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 a production target of around five to six tons per crop in the very, very short duration of six months. So now uh, the organization that is the Embeda, Embeda is one of the organization which is dealing with the Milan Products Export Development Agency. So they deal with different kind of uh, Marine product exports. So they are also dealing with the uh, the culture promotion and also to have the production of the monosex uh, seeds because the monosex seeds uh, this is very very uh, important from the angle that now government is uh, not allowing any kind of non monosex tilapia to grow in the ponds. So only the monosex tilapia can be grown. So and now they are empowering or they are giving the registration to many of the uh, seed producers uh, for production of this. Uh, one of six the strength uh, of this gift tilapia uh, by using some of the hormones like methyl testosterone. So this is being sold. So, but now the concern regarding this one of six of uh, production in by the private companies is that uh, many of the farmers they are complaining about the the sex reversal in the in the in the, in the midway of the culture because because of the hormonal treatment may not be adequate or there are, are some genetic issues with the, the strength they are using. So this is again a big concern where Ampeda and the Indian government has to look into. Now coming to the uh, brackish water and marine sector, uh, I want to focus more on the stream farming because this is now becoming a very, very important industry in India. Uh, right uh, back in the 1990s, uh, this type of farming systems of streams where it coincided with the the production of the shrimp in other countries like uh, Ecuador, Chile, Thailand. So they were doing mostly the shrimp farming in the, in the open waters where it is connected to the sea. So in India also they did this shrimp farming in a very extensive mode or maybe the traditional mode where they, they have the system of auto stocking. Auto stocking is nothing but where the, the high during the high tide, the, the shrimp it comes along with the tide and they make one some kind of burn or the embankments in the, in the coastal zones. And these are stocked with the, the natural seed resources, and they do no, no any kind of feeding. And the streams, it grows by itself. So that was the type of farming system during the 80s. But during the 1990s, uh, major changes in India happened uh, before, uh, regarding the stream farming. Uh, it is because uh, uh, there was a loss of, uh, uh, what to say, uh, seed production of the stream happened during 1988. In India, and in India, there were many stream hatcheries 
government stream hatcheries uh, to supply the major chunk of the supply of the stream seed. So with the ability of the more number of the stream seed, the farming expansion happened and uh, there was lots of chaos regarding the uh, deforestation of the mangroves and also different kind of uh, ecological concerns. But uh, as soon as they developed the stream farming since 1990 to 1994, there was like uh, improper planning and improper, what to say, uh, implementation of the different policies. So WSSB, which was uh, uh, a very big pandemic globally, it also attacked India in 1994. And because of this, there was a very huge loss in the industry. And uh, because of this, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, they banned the, the stream farming activities uh, which in the areas which are near to the shore in, in less than 500 meters. And further, there was other problems of the other disease like blue cell syndrome. So stream farming was obviously like uh, in a downfall side during these 90s. Then came the Coastal Ecological Authority and the MPEDA, uh, which are the two authorities which is mostly regulating the, the farming activities of the stream in the coastal zone of India. And uh, in the year 2003, there was a debate uh, on the introduction of a, a exotic species that is Lithopinus banamai, which is a native of uh, Southern America. So the SPF grew stock from this Hawaii Island, this were important to India to have a, a trial on the productivity of this particular stream. And this pilot scale demonstration started during 2009 in, the, in some of the selected farms that is registered under the government. So since then, uh, uh, it was successful and India is now uh, more on like uh, 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 transforming many of the uh, farming uh, component from Penis Monodon to Penis uh, uh, Little Penis Banamai uh, since 2009. And you can see the, the huge change in the current level of production in India. Uh, this is the some of the important stream farming states in India. Again, Andhra Pradesh, which is uh, a very, very important player in stream production. Uh, they produce a majority of the uh, stream produce, produce in India. Now, coming to these two species, uh, why India took over to Panama instead of the indigenous monodon is because of the different criteria, different advantages they have. Like if you can go for higher stock intensity, it has a higher growth rate, and it has tolerance capacity to different kind of uh, environmental conditions. And also they have the low protein requirement, and more importantly, the crop period, crop period of this lithopinus banana is only 90 days compared to 120 days for monodon. So in that case, uh, the farmers are now able to ha have three or four crops a year in, in, uh, instead of uh, just two or three crops for this monodon. So this was the advantage and the more of the farming community, they, they shifted to this banana. And when they saw that uh, the export value or the export demand for this banana is very, very high, in some of the countries like USA. And uh, so they, they started to produce more of this banana and almost now like mono, like this uh, monodon farming is almost very, very confined to only few states like West Bengal where they do the, the organic waste farming of this uh, little uh, of this penis monodon. This is the stream farm uh, by the size. Uh, many of the farmer, many of the farms in India, these are the small size uh, of less than two hectare farms, that is more than 90% of the total farm area. And this is the trend in the production over the, over the years from 2010, after the introduction of the banana, you can see the, the, the production was very low. Since then, how it pick up? Uh, India is also like uh, very, like, uh, very blessed, I should say, or opportunity in other sense, uh, like during the 2014 when EMS, early mortality syndrome virus disease. This happened in many of the countries like, like uh, Thailand and Ecuador or Chile. So India picked up that pace because the supply for uh, supply for the stream farm is reduced dramatically in those areas. So coinciding with that, India produced more of these streams during those 2014, 2016. So it, during this was the time when India picked up the, uh, the pace of stream farming. Further down uh, 2017, 18, 19, uh, the growth rate uh, it, growth, it, it increased steadily, and then 2020 uh, because of the pandemic, uh, there was like many of the problems, like the, because many of the uh, feed materials has to be supplied to distant places, and the workforce, the manpower workforce was not available. So because of that uh, pandemic, uh, the stream farming 
production uh, it again went down in 2020. So this is the global comparison of the measures in farming of the countries where the blue one uh, is India. Yeah, this one. So how it is picking up uh, yeah, along with Ecuador. Ecuador is also a, a producer of uh, shrimp, but they are mostly on the capture fisheries, whereas the Indian uh, production is mainly, mainly based on the uh, farm shrimps. Now the challenges in stream farming is now like, uh, although the farming production is increasing, but the export market is decreasing. This is a big concern because uh, as I have told you, Indian farming has to now balance between the, the indigenous and the exotic varieties. So here you can see uh, there is a very, very drastic decline in the export market values uh, over the last, uh, last few years. And these are export destination. Uh, right now, as for the uh, 2019 data, India is doing the export mostly to the countries like USA, then China, then European Union, Japan. So the export destination for these uh, countries, they prefer to have banana mine and the small size shrimps. Whereas in the earlier days, that is during the 2005 to 2010, India's export market was for European Union and the Japan, uh, where they demand for the bigger size uh, uh, shrimps like this uh, penis monodon. So now the government is now uh, giving some policies like where they are encouraging the farmers to go for the monodon and the indicus on a proportionate way, not entirely proportionate way. So they are giving more emphasis there and now there are some type of organic farming system in the Kavdi Valley and West Temple where they try to promote the, the organic stream farming of uh, local species. Apart from this, uh, uh, the culture of monodon, uh, culture of uh, freshwater prawn, which is mostly farmed in the freshwater areas of India, which was like uh, into its peak period during the 2005 uh, in Andhra Pradesh, because of the introduction of this vanamai, the culture of this uh, uh, scampi or freshwater prawn declined drastically. But in the recent year, around 2019-20, uh, it has reached a, a production target of around 85,000 tons. Uh, so now, many of the farmers now they have started to pick up this uh, Rosenbergi because this is mainly because of the local demands. Where the stream squeeze was a export oriented uh, product. Now, the, the domestic market for these prawns is also improving, and the, many of the farmers now they have started to do the, the culture of these prawns, either as the monoculture system or even the polyculture with the carbs also. So this is a big uh, uh, change that India is happening now. And uh, the challenge will be like how much of the area can be covered under this scandy farming in spite of the, 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 the drastic decline in the, in the export value of the streams. Uh, regarding the coastal agriculture and mariculture, fin fishes and uh, some molluscan, uh, you can say that India is still a a, what to say in a very very uh, early stage of farming of this banana species, except for a few of the important species like less calcarifer, which people are doing for a decade. Whereas the other farm, uh, other species like these uh, groupers, orange spotted grouper, then pompano, and this cobia, they have a high potential for introduction in India. But uh, the reality is that uh, the commercialization is yet to happen in a very very significant way. Because uh, the seed production technology and the farming technology is available for this species or the or the, this, this crustacean species, but many of the farmers they are not uh, what to say ready to take it in a very very commercial scale. Yeah, that may be due to the the financial constraints or the technical constraints. So that is again a very big challenge for India now. And uh, these are the the production, uh, production of the different kind of uh, mollusca, mollusca and fin fishes by one of the very important organizations in India, that is the CMFRI. This is one of the ICER Institute in India, which deals with the, the marine fisheries and aquaculture. Uh, the full form of the CMFRI is Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute in Cochin. So they do different kind of uh, breeding program. They do develop the different kind of farming system to utilize the different kind of water resources in the marine waters. So they are most more focused on this uh, type of uh, species in India.
Now coming to case farming. Uh, case farming uh, in India, in the marine cases, or it may be the in uh, inbound cases. This is the open water cases, and this is one another one is the inbound cases. So CM Fry, they have developed some kind of technology for case farming of uh, three important species, that is the sea bass, cobia, and compound in India. Uh, the sea cages are very small diameter, small size cages. These are uh, six meter diameter cages, which are which are suitable for Indian conditions because uh, unlike Singapore, uh, the Indian coast is very turbulent and it's very difficult to uh, have the site selection for installation of those cages. So bigger the cages, there is always a better chances of, uh, of damage and also the fouling activities of by different kind of fouling organisms. So in India, uh, this case culture, uh, people are doing in a what is semi-commercial way with the support of the government and also there are different subsidies available for case farming. Uh, but there are difficulties, uh, I'll, be, I'll be mentioning the challenges. Yeah, there are some constraints or challenges, like policy challenges is one, one, one important thing. Although the, the union government has uh, uh, promoted the use of these uh, open water bodies, but there are different cons conflicts uh, due to the multi-users conflicts. So there is no any clear-cut policy framework which are uh, meant for case farming because like in those area where the, the area is suitable for case farming there there are the users like the navigation channels are available and also there are the conflicts between the fishermen and the aquaculturists. Uh, the fishermen and is because also the coastal zone in india they are more dependent on the uh, local fisheries as a means of livelihood so again uh, this conflict is always happening between the fishermen and the, the aquaculturists who are doing the case culture Technical issues uh, with regard to the, the standardization of the breeding protocols of some of the species. Uh, although it is commercialized, although it is standardized in the laboratory, when the farmers take up, there are different technical problems and they are not able to resolve that. And also identifying the markets. Although we have diversified the marine species for promotion in India, so first we have to go for the identifying the market value of the particular fish and uh, until now as we do that, uh, there is not going to be a very economical venture. And also the system adaptation, because many of the cases, uh, these are meant, these are standardized for one particular location based on the hydrological parameters of the particular location. But if you go and uh, uh, do the same thing in, on the other parts of the uh, country, the, they need to have the local adaptation because the coastal zone in India is also quite diverse in terms of hydrological uh, uh, characteristics. So we have to go for the design of the different type of cases for different locations. And now the recently Indian government is now uh, doing a big project on the GIS and remote sensing mapping of the different water resources where this case culture can be done very, very effectively. Finance is another one issue where the, 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 most of these farmers, these are small and marginal farmers and they are not able to uh, uh, invest heavily on such type of farming systems, although they wanted to uh, go for the venture, but they don't have the financial uh, empowerment. Manpower is another issue. Uh, they need to have the desired skill and knowledge about gas farming. And uh, most of the fishermen now uh, in India, there are uh, some regulations regarding the man fishing policy where they ban the fishing of the, uh, the, the open water bodies during two months, that is May and June in the both West Coast and East Coast. So now, government is now uh, giving incentives to promote the case farming, to use those fishermen as a manpower for the uh, for the case farming in those lean period. So this is another challenge. Another just I wanted to highlight about the ornamental fish industry, although it's not very significant industry in India. Uh, the domestic market is very good. Uh, domestic market it earns a tune of around 550 Indian rupees, uh, 550 Indian pro Indian rupees, whereas the export market is very, very low. The contribution of India to the global ornamental arena is less than 1% of the value. And uh, most of these uh, uh, export oriented species, these are mostly coming from the northern part of the country. Uh, this is the northern part uh, in the map I'm showing. So this is a very, very big biodiversity hotspot and uh, many of the fishes has the ornamental values. And uh, even to Singapore, these are uh, exported via Kolkata. 
the more of the channel of the market is that uh, people do harvest of these uh, ornamental species. These are important ornamental species that we, we are doing research on now. So these species are being harvested from the wild. They are collected by the local uh, people, and uh, there is a channel where intermediate channel where they they do the export from the Kolkata market and to that finally going to different countries like Japan and Singapore or different kind of South Asian countries. So all these fishes they are of high value. They, they cost uh, more than six dollars, seven dollars in the international market. So they are having the high potential. So now the concern is regarding the, the, the biodiversity concerns and also sustainability concerns. Now, as because earlier, most of these species were harvested from the wild. Uh, now there is a need to domesticate them and to have the proper breeding and culture protocol so that uh, we have the less dependence on the wild, wild harvest and we can go for the culture-based ornamental fisheries. So based on that, uh, our institute also is doing a one big project on this. Uh, that is the documentation of the different ornamental resources and other fruit pieces from the entire area. And we have documented, we have the repository of more than 250 species from that uh, particular region. And we have selected a few of those and we are now going for the breeding protocol. We have standardized the breeding protocol of these species. Uh, these are some of the model species with models, uh, especially these are, these are known to be a fruit pieces, but they are very uh, attractive and very colorful model species like uh, this type of models are available in the northern area, and now we are promoting the, the culture of these uh, models through uh, some small self help group or women groups where we, we can do this type of activities in a very small scale. So these are a few other ornamental species of importance in the, in the area. Uh, regarding the coffee industry, I just wanted to highlight because uh, the coffee industry is more of the, have the linkage with the shrimp farming and the, the most of the coffee industry, these are located in the Andhra Pradesh and they, and they produce almost more than half of these uh, coffees in India. And some of the important coffee companies in India like Avanti Face, Cardio Eco Nutrition and CP India. CP is actually, uh, it is a Th Thailand based company and Godress Agrobit Limited. So these are a few of the, uh, the coffee industry that is prevalent in India. And uh, the coffee market is valued at around 1.4 billion US dollar in India in 2020. So summing up uh, all these activities of the, the agriculture in India. So I like uh, this, uh, this came, came out to my thought and uh, my analysis of the scenario in India. So there are challenges regarding the strict policy regulations because now uh, stream farming is uh, becoming a very uh, more of a business oriented models. So in that uh, there are policy guidelines which are framed that uh, the Indian farming condition has to maintain a minimum stock intensity of around 40 PL per meter square. But in, in, in many of the areas where uh, this kind of activity is done, they do go for 60 or 70 PL per meter square, which is very, very likely to have a very impact on the prevalence or emergence of new diseases in India. Then the careful diversification based on niche. This is very important because India now going for diversification of many species, many starting from the streams to the local species. So first we have to go uh, for a proper market a proper market survey of the of the species that has to be diversified. And another one is the environmental sustainability, uh, because this is true, because in all aspects, agriculture is now being looked as a, a, a environmental polluters by many of the other sectors, because uh, we have to see that uh, proper uh, SOPs are maintained, so that the environmental impacts are very, very less now. With this regard, uh, in India, the stream farms, which are very, very small farms, now Indian government has now started to have the cluster type of farming, cluster-based farming system where the, the small farm, they pull together and they have the different treatment plants. So this is mandatory for the farms having five hectares and above. So once uh, they treat all the influence and they drain into the environmental uh, open water bodies, so this is going to have the less impact. So that kind, that kind of policy, that kind of process has to be implemented for all other uh, purposes also. This is emergence, mostly this transboundary disease and biosecurity protocols has to be implemented. Transboundary disease because many of the uh, many of the species now 
uh, India, uh, if, a, if a species is going from one state to another state, India is a big country and uh, the local climatic conditions and the uh, susceptibility of a particular host to different kind of disease is different. So transboundary within India and also within the countries is, has to be regulated in a very, very effective way by means of uh, having a very strict biosecurity protocol in India. The promotion of organic farming uh, is taking up uh, in India also, but organic farming now the problem is with the, the market. Although, like if you say the, the example of Sri Lanka recently, the, where they have uh, a very downfall of the, the country economy because of the organic farming. Because until now we have a market for the organic products, you have, you, until now we have the set of standards and regulations and the market, we cannot go directly to go for the organic farming because after all, a farmer has to earn money uh, for his livelihood. Then alternative to different ingredients on demand now, uh, India is also having the challenge of using this fish milk because the fish milk supply is stagnant and uh, the, the fish milk uh, industry is having the more demand of the fish milk. So we have to go for alternative protein sources. Awareness programs and vocational programs, uh, mostly on the, the high-tech systems like uh, Bioflow or RS, so, so vocational programs are required with the government financial incentives to be given. And food safety in whole sense is very important. Food safety because uh, in India, so the fish are produced in one state and is transported to other states, which takes a, a seven to even 15 days. So during the process, there has been a quality deterioration and also the need for whole sense supply where they can store the, the, the products for a longer period of time. So this is very, very poor in India. So this has to be developed. So this is just a sum up of the different uh, status based on that I have analyzed and these are the challenges. So with this, I conclude my presentation. Uh, I think well, I hope this was useful because uh, we have a very, a very uh, a poor knowledge about the Indian conditions. Just I wanted to present it how it's happening in India in a very short time. So, so thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.